Um, I'm so grateful to have been invited. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I don't get out that much anymore. I'm getting out a little bit more now, but in case you're wondering what on earth have I been doing, uh, I've been working for Pivotal for over five years now. And when I joined, I, I joined to work on Cloud Foundry, and we had an interesting journey ahead of us. Now, at the time that I joined Pivotal, it was before Pivotal existed. Uh, if you know the name Pivotal, you probably know it from Pivotal Tracker or Pivotal Labs. Uh, and those are part of Pivotal, but Pivotal Labs was 250 people-ish when it was acquired by EMC. Um, and then subsequently, a company was born from EMC and VMware that was 2,000 people at birth. It took the name Pivotal from Pivotal Labs, but it was not Pivotal Labs. And in fact, um, so many different entities, products, cultures went into forming that 2,000 person company, there was no guarantee that we were going to have any resemblance whatsoever to Pivotal Labs. Because remember, Pivotal Labs was 250 people, which means that there were about 1,750 people for whom the Pivotal Labs way was at best weird. And at worst, Seriously, I, I, I had people tell me that they felt that the Pivotal Labs extreme programming practices were, um, they were dehumanizing, they thought, and they treated engineers uh, as fungible assets, which is not true. Um, for, for the record, this is, this is the antithesis of the intention behind the Pivotal Labs extreme programming practices, which are intended to help teams be self-organizing and, and empowered and to empower individuals and, and allow people to fully uh, 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 participate in an act of creation, which is ultimately the most human thing there is. But if you look at it from the outside, I can also understand how those 1,750 people thought at best this is weird. And I'll give you one example of, of weird. Uh, to them, so a bunch of people who had never been at a Pivotal Labs office before, who were from another Pivotal office, came up to San Francisco, and on Tuesdays we do tech talks, and so uh, the, the bell rings to signal that it's okay to come get food. Now I, I have to back up and explain, um, Pivotal Labs consultants uh, keep very strict hours, and part of the reason for that is, is being able to be fully present for your team. It, it, it really is disruptive to flow if people are coming and going at random times and you never can really count on when you're going to be able to pair with your, your partner. If your pair keeps disappearing for no apparent reason, it's very disruptive. And so we keep fairly strict hours. Now, given that we keep fairly strict hours, uh, lunch starts at 12.30, but for people who are not labs consultants, they can take lunch whenever, and we bring food in on Tuesdays. And so we had had a problem in some offices where the food was all gone before the consultants were let go. Uh, you know, the, let go is the wrong word, because nobody stands there and says, okay, dismissed. But before, before the consultants took their break, right? And how terrible is it to watch everybody else get food, and then you get up, and there, there's no food for you. That's sad, right? And we want to make sure everybody is healthy and happy and fed and, and so forth. And so we have a tradition, a ritual. We ring a, a bell. In San Francisco, it's a cow bell. In other places, it's a gong. The, the actual sound depends on the office. But there is a signal that indicates, soup's on. You can go eat now, right? So now imagine that you come from another office. You have never seen this before. You're watching an entire room full of, it's, it's an open floor plan, bunch of people are pairing. You're watching them work away, and then all of a sudden a bell rings, and in unison, everyone stands up, turns, and walks to the kitchen. I can kind of understand why we got a reputation for being a little weird and a little dehumanizing. Looked like Dawn of the Dead to all of the people from outside San Francisco. Um, but anyway, so uh, we've been on this journey as Pivotal. I participated in uh, helping transform the practices for the Cloud Foundry team from the original process to uh, the, the uh, fairly strict form of the Pivotal Labs process. And then subsequently, 
um, I stuck my hand up to go help out in the, the data products. And that's where I've been for the last three years. And so I don't get out much anymore because I'm kind of busy inside. Um, but things have, have, have progressed and I'm getting out more. So I'm super happy to be here and very grateful. I would like to take you back in time. The year for me was approximately 2000. And I published this in 2001. Um, a paper called Better Testing, Worse Quality. I don't know if any of you have ever heard it. I have told this story before, so please forgive me if this is a repeat for you. Hopefully there'll be new, new details. Um, but back in 2000, I was hired by a company, Silicon Valley startup, shipped enterprise software. Um, they were very concerned about quality. The perceived quality was low. People who got our software were skeptical. There were bugs all over the place. So perceived quality was low. Now this is a diagram of effects. The theory was that if we invest heavily, now this is where we get to make a choice. Management made a choice. We're going to invest heavily in building out an independent QA team. Because of course, if you have low quality, hiring a bunch of people with the title QA, that's going to fix it. <laughs> yeah, you laugh now. That was totally the norm back then. I'll bet that there are some companies here for whom it is still kind of the norm. Yes, some of you are nodding. OK, so of course, you hire a bunch of QA people. They find a bunch of bugs. OK, so this indicates a positive correlation. More QA people, more bugs. Makes sense, right? And of course, if we find more bugs, and assuming that we choose to fix them, then the number of known bugs we ship goes down, right? And if the number of known bugs goes down, then perceived quality will go up. This looks awesome, doesn't it? Thus is the basis for the vast majority of QA departments on the planet. Furthermore, if we're finding all the bugs, more bugs found, fewer unknown bugs, fewer unknown bugs, higher quality. This is great, right? I affectionately refer to this as the quality pumpkin. But wait, there's more. <laughs> We all know that developer testing is important, like nobody would say it's not important, right? So if we choose to also invest in developer testing, then the lurking bugs are going to go down, right? Now, that means fewer bugs found in QA, but that's fine, right? And, and if the lurking bugs go down, then unknown bugs also go down. This is all good, right? Oh, but wait. If we work at preventing bugs, then we'll have even fewer. So this is the quality pumpkin. It looks awesome, right? Now, I want you to put yourself in my shoes. I got hauled into my boss's office, the VP. My boss said, so, Elizabeth, help me understand. You've, you've been here for, at the time, 18 months. In that time, we have given you all the resources you asked for. You wanted money to hire people, we let you hire people. You wanted money to hire more skilled people, we let you hire more skilled people. We built you a lab. We got you all the hardware you asked for. We gave you funding for all the software that you asked for. We got you funding for the training that you asked for. We literally gave you everything that you asked for. How is it that our software quality has gotten worse? That was a bad day. <laughs> Because he was right. I mean, I couldn't even argue with him. We were about to get kicked out of customers. Ultimately, by the way, this company completely imploded. It's gone off the face of the planet. Nobody's ever heard of it before. So what happened? I drew out a diagram of effects just to help me think through this. And then I realized what happened. There was a connection I had not previously thought about. But the more I thought about it, the more convinced that I was right, that there was a connection there. Holy crap, wait, what? The more an independent QA team got strong, the more we flexed that muscle, the more the developer testing muscle atrophied. And I remembered actually hearing people say things like, dear developer, why are you still like testing and messing around with that thing? There's a QA department over there. Give it to them. They're going to find all your bugs. Get on to coding the next thing. 
<sighs> so what we'd really done was to extend the latency of our feedback loops. Now at the time, I wasn't thinking about latency of feedback loops, but that was really what was going on. So let's look at this. Not only did we have that whole quality death, it's, it, it, by the way, I affectionately call it the quality pumpkin, but the reality is it's the quality death spiral. I don't recommend. Anyway, I, uh, not only did we have the quality death spiral thing going on, we also were very traditional. Remember, this was the year 2000. Extreme Programming Explained was published in 1999, so it's not that nobody knew, but it was still this super bizarro fringe thing that nobody had ever heard of. Um, and at the time, I had Brian Merrick kind of pinging me, going, hey, there's some really interesting people over here and you should be paying attention to them. And I was going, yeah, yeah, Extreme. It sounds like bungee jump cords. It's, 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 it's coding with parachutes, no thank you, right? So that's, that's kind of where Extreme Programming was. Agile was a thing, but it was very fringe at the time. So this was totally the norm. You had phases and they were very long. Like we're talking year long releases or two years. One company that I once consulted for, their planned cycle was three years. And when three years ran over, it was a five year cycle to release anything. Ooh. Okay, so in the analyze phase, this is months, like three, four or five months, depending. <coughs> We're speculating. We're speculating that we understand the real problem as opposed to the solutions that our users come to us with because they always come to us handing us solutions and we have to do five whys and really analyze what do they actually need. So we're capturing all of these requirements and we're speculating that we have understood correctly. And then we're designing solutions to meet those requirements and we're speculating that our design is good, but it should be because it looks great on PowerPoint. Then we start implementing and we may be speculating a little bit less because that PowerPoint design that looked so awesome actually turned out to not work so well in practice. And then we're stabilizing. That's the QA phase. That's, that's where my group would typically come in. And then we're planning to do a big bang release. And everything under that curve is risk because we've got really high feedback latency. So not only did we have the quality death spiral, but we also had massively long feedback latency. By the way, is anybody still living in this world? Good! <laughs> okay, at least one of you is like, <laughs> but actually, look how far we've come as an industry. Because this, this was 18 years ago. And 18 years ago, this was the norm, right? We had all of the best practices that, that talked about preventing all of the defects. So a lot has changed in 18 years, and it's not just about changing minds. Tooling has changed as well to support a different way of working. Now, uh, this is a talk with a lot of digressions, by the way. So here is one of the digressions, Schrodinger's cat. So in 1935, Schrodinger wrote a letter to Einstein, and they were talking about quantum mechanics, and, and Schrodinger proposed the thought experiment. Okay, look, so what you're really saying with all of this probability wave stuff is that if we take a cat and we put the cat in a steel box, and then we connect that steel box to a poison gas tank, and then we, we connect that poison gas tank to a radioactive isotope that within an hour, if there's a 50-50 probability that that radioactive isotope is, is going to decay or not decay. And if it decays, then we release the poison gas. And if it doesn't decay, then we don't. And what you're really saying is that the cat is both alive and dead until you open the box to see what was going on, at which point the probability wave collapses. Now, Schrodinger's point was, really? Come on. Um, but Actually, it turns out kind of, yeah, because quantum is weird. So anyway, this is Schrodinger's cat. What we were doing was Schrodinger's release. <laughs> Until you opened the box to see whether or not the release was live or dead, you didn't actually know, probability wave has to collapse. OK, so feedback cycles were too long. But wait, what is this feedback thing? Let's, let's make it super simple. Feedback is actually really, really simple. You do a thing and then you see what happened. And then you do another thing, and then you see what happens again, right? That's all a feedback loop is. Now, there are lots of ways of talking about this. Plan, do, check, act, the Deming cycle. OODA loops, thank you, uh, 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 John Boyd, right? Um, for that matter, lean startup. Uh, we have now, by the way, hit the point where it is no longer mandatory for speakers to put the lean startup book in their talk, but I still do. But 
build, measure, learn is basically a feedback loop, right? So this is all about feedback. And what we've been talking about is that feedback latency thing. And as you think about feedback latency, there are many, many different kinds of feedback. And so, uh, let's see, what was it? I think 1999 was also the year that Kent Beck, and I have forgotten who now, um, maybe Garrett Gamma, who I don't actually know in person, but they coded up this little thing called JUnit. And, and shared that with Martin Fowler, and by the way, there is a recording on YouTube that I did, so I know it's there, of, of Kent Beck talking about this experience, having coded this thing up, sent it to Martin Fowler, didn't hear anything back, thought, oh, well, I guess that's useless to anybody else. And a few months later, checked in with Martin Fowler to say, hey, did you ever have any reaction to that thing I sent you? And Martin Fowler's like, oh my god, world changing! And if you know Martin Fowler, he doesn't actually say things like that very often. Um, so uh, the advent of super lightweight unit testing frameworks that make it ridiculously easy to write that next little unit test as, as long as you, your code under test isn't a horrible legacy mess that resists the attempt to write unit <laughs> tests. Um, that's going to give you a super fast feedback loop. Now it is giving you a super fast feedback loop along one dimension, which is the question as a programmer, does my code exhibit the behavior that I intended for it to exhibit? which is why you can't use unit tests for all of the different kinds of feedback. It's a very specific kind. But as you look at all of these feedback loops and different types of feedback, feedback gets longer and longer the farther out you go. You still probably need to answer these questions. But if you attempt to wait until, say, manual scripted regression testing, which was the norm in the year 2000, then your feedback cycles are going to be very, very long, and you're going to have terrible problems. So different levels answer different questions, and the thing that you want to do is push the answering of a question as far down as you possibly can to tighten up those feedback loops and make them go faster. Makes sense, right? So the theor theory is that Agile does this. Right? We tighten the feedback loops, we focus on a lot of developer testing, all 100% automated testing, uh, uh, CI pipelines that are going to run all of those tests automatically. So in theory, with every iteration, we're collapsing those probability waves so that we never actually have the big bang gigantic Schrodinger's release. This is the theory. So with each little release, collapse the probability wave, substantially reduces the risk. Now, there is a caveat here. And this, unfortunately, is too much the norm for too many organizations. Let's see how many of you cringe. With each iteration, you do most of the testing. Some of you are already nodding. You can see where I'm going. So the developers have done all of the developer testing. Maybe the product manager has done acceptance testing. But maybe there's some um, security testing that doesn't get done. Maybe there's some performance testing that doesn't get done. Maybe, actually, as actually was the case in some of our teams within Pivotal who had not come from the Pivotal Labs DNA originally, maybe there is this very painful full regression cycle that is just so expensive, both in terms of time and in terms of machine cost to run, that you don't want to run it too many times, so you wait to run it until after everything else is done, and then you wait. Because that feels like sort of the responsible thing to do, right? Hint, no, it's not. But it <laughs> feels like we twitch as humans. We go, oh, that hurts, that hurts, that hurts. So I'm only going to do it as few times as I possibly can. Makes sense, right? So as each iteration goes, that gap between really done and totally 100% done done, that gap grows. Do any of your organizations talk about done versus done done? <laughs> I know, right? <coughs> so here's the thing. 18 years ago, that whole monolithic, gigantic, we're going to plan, the release takes a year, we're going to have Gantt charts, and we're going to have dependency tracking. Um, all of that was the norm 18 years ago. It's no longer the norm. We all look at that and we go, what were we thinking? And then we do this. 
And we have, oh, by the way, yeah, we have a right before release, gigantic test thing, cycle, whatever. Some call it the test sprint. <laughs> oh, just shoot me. <laughs> and guess what? The risk curve ends up looking exactly the same because the level of speculation grows. And so we work in a completely different way. We have completely different tooling. We talk about pipelines. We talk about testing. We talk about all of the right things, and yet we get what looks like almost the same result. Anybody living in that world? It hurts, right? Now, only a few of you are nodding, so wait, wait, let's, let's check to make sure that y'all are awake. <laughs> How many of you are living in the perfect world of unicorns and pixie dust and... <laughs> You never have long feedback cycles. You never have bad surprises. Wait, okay, so somewhere between living in, oh, ow, 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 and living in, oh. <laughs> Everybody else lives somewhere in between those two states? Okay. Digression, fruit flies. Why do we use fruit flies for a lot of scientific experiments? Super short life cycle. You can get generations and generations and generations of fruit flies in, I don't actually know, days, months, weeks, I'm not sure, but it's really short. So you can run all kinds of experiments. Feedback cycle length really, really matters. So let's talk about a real world case study of this. This one is from Cloud Foundry. So in the early days when I got involved with Cloud Foundry, the original team had a process in place that started with writing code. Then somebody makes a change, runs all the tests in their local environment. All the tests running in a local environment took about an hour to run before they could check in. They would then check in on a branch. CI would then kick off all the unit tests before sending it off to Garrett. So Garrett would reflect, okay, you can go do the code review now, it's okay to review. And at that point, who knows how long it takes. Kind of depended on how much the reviewers liked you. A <laughs> Little bit, how motivated they were. So there was this very weird system where very senior programmers who had very strong ties with the other very senior programmers who could actually plus two your thing, you didn't even have to get two people to agree, you could get somebody to plus two it, they would get their changes in fairly quickly. Like, you know, on order of hours at the most. But I talked with a fairly junior programmer on the team at the time, who by the way, amazingly talented, junior should not be interpreted to mean in any way less talented, merely fewer years of experience. But there was a two class system in place where there were the seniors and then there was everybody else. And she could not get the attention of the seniors. So it sat in code review and it sat in code review. And of course, everybody else is getting changes pushed in, so she's having to rebase and rerun those local tests. She told me she once spent an entire week trying to get like a five-line change in. Because whenever somebody else would push some code into the master, she would have to rebase, rerun the tests, it resubmits to Garrett, and then it would go back into the, the hopper for, for code review. Eventually, once your change is approved, then it would get merged to master and then it would rerun, all, the CI would rerun the full set of tests, which took eh, an hour-ish, give or take. Um, it, 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 you wanna talk about a dehumanizing process? Having to wait and, and spend your entire week just rebasing other people's work with yours so, so that you can run all the tests. And oh, what an incredible waste of human brain power. So we made some changes. Um, we pair in Pivotal Labs. Uh, and so we, we worked with the team to get a working agreement that if you pair on code, that counts as the code review because we're doing continuous code review, essentially. So if we pair on the code, then we will run local tests, but we're just gonna run the short suite locally. And if something breaks in CI, then it's not a, a blame thing. I mean, we stop the line and we fix it, 
but it's 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 kind of like no no foul, no harm, no foul. Just just revert the change or fix it immediately, as long as we unblock the pipeline. So we push to master. CI runs the full tests. We went from changes taking days to a week, maybe even more than a week, depending on the change and depending on who did it, to changes getting pushed in. Simple change could get pushed in and, and, and be on master and actually committed and there and real and ready to ship in the space of eh, hour and a bit. Substantial change. And the side effect of doing that, remember the mayfly? Not only were we more productive, but we learned more and learned faster. And so the overall velocity of the team increased, not only because we could get stuff done faster, but because we learned faster. It was phenomenal. And this is the way that the Cloud Foundry team works today. And it's why the team, um, relatively small team at that point, the team was Depends on how you count it and which parts you count, but maybe 30 people, and it's grown substantially now. But for, for a period of time, we were getting a phenomenal amount of work done with 30 to 50 people because we were able to learn incredibly fast and we, we got all of the roadblocks out of the way that prevented change from going in. This was a system that was designed with the idea that perfection is the goal. Perfection can't be the goal. Because if then the time that it takes you to prevent all of the possible risks, you're radically increasing the overall risk uh, of, of things going very badly when you actually ship. Now, that's not the only source of, of uh, long latency. It's not just preventing changes from going in at all. Um, there's another source of latency that we experienced. This was on Greenplum. On Greenplum, the norm had been for teams to have their own branch. So teams would all push to their shared team branch. This sounded way better than individuals having branches, which had been the norm prior, and they had made a radical improvement by having team branches. Only then there was this notion of the Big Bang integration. So relatively short time prior to the intended release, a group of people who are the designated merge people. <laughs> My heart already hurts with the inhumanity of that. Imagine if your entire job is taking creations that other people made and trying to fit them together. Ah. But there were people who did this and, and, and who, who didn't hate their lives, so I guess it was okay. Um, all except for the part where things didn't go together nicely. And there, there, there was a time in the past before I got involved with this team where the, they had actually had to throw out an entire team's work for months and months and months, like completely throw it out because there was no way to merge it in. There were so, so many merge conflicts. They just threw it all out and they started over. Oh, that hurts. So, we, we changed. We now do short-lived feature branches. Um, there are good reasons in this case to do feature branches. There are trade-offs between feature branches and always push to master. I was an always push to master person before I got there. I learned to be flexible because sometimes there are good reasons for feature branches. But it's really, at that point, it's all about the batch size. The problem here was that the batch size was massive. So you take these gigantic batches and you try to bash them together and the odds of getting to stability in a reasonable amount of time are very, very low. Feature branch, absolutely worst case. You've worked on it for a few days. You can't figure out how to actually get it merged in. And oh, by the way, there is no more merge team. You're responsible for merging in your, as a team, you're responsible for merging in your own stuff. Um, and if you can't figure out how to merge it in, absolute worst case, we've lost a few days. That's bad, but it's not like months of an entire team's worth of work. Right? So here's the thing. It's very human to confuse speed with progress. That model felt amazing to people. 
It felt good. At the end of the day, I felt productive. I got my changes in. They are there. They're running. It's awesome. I didn't have to fight with all those other people and their code. I got my stuff in. Feels great. We are not making progress. But it's a very human thing to want to get what feels like distractions out of the way. Okay, we're going to come back to that, but I want to talk about feedback cleanliness because now we've been talking about latency, but there's another dimension of the care and feeding of your feedback loops because it's not enough to get fast feedback if your feedback is like this. How many of you have builds like this? You run the build. <laughs> and somebody says, oh, it's fine. <laughs> Just run it again. <laughs> So you run it again with no changes, and that happens. Now try one more time. It just had to warm the cache. It's fine. <laughs> so you run it again with no changes. Anybody living in this world? Uh-huh. Also hurts. Ah, oh, when you can't trust the answer that CI gives you, it doesn't matter how fast CI gives you that answer. So it's not just about speed. It's also about the cleanliness of your feedback loops. This is really a, a flaky test problem, but there are other forms of problems. This is actually, flaky tests are simply one example of a signal to noise ratio. I used to think that false positives were worse than false negatives. I used to think that. Because if, if, you know, if, if there was actually a bug, but all the tests are green, obviously this is bad, right? We can't trust the tests. They are lying to us. They're making us feel all warm and fuzzy and good. So the, the, that is terrible. Um, the, the way I learned that false negatives are just as bad, I think they're equally bad, was on a project. In fact, it was my first Pivotal Labs project, which, by the way, was completely life transforming. 2005, I weaseled my way onto a labs project, got to experience extreme programming on an actual real project for a real Pivotal Labs customer. Um, and I, I, we were working on a system where the, the customer had uh, a, an acceptance test framework. Now, as is often the case, that acceptance test framework was made by an independent QA organization who was never really, um, I'm going to say given enough time, even though there's a lot of nuance there about who gets to give you time versus you taking time. And we're not going to go into all that nuance. We'll just say they were never really given the time. Um, nor uh, allowed to make it a priority to make that acceptance test framework stable, which meant that there were very, very small things that had nothing to do with the product itself that was being tested that would result in tests failing. And so on that project, I had written a bunch of acceptance tests in their framework. I ran all the acceptance tests. I would get these false failures. And on this particular run, there were like 148 tests. And there were something like 73 failures. <coughs> Oof. But nothing in the code under test had changed. I was just trying to test my tests. And, 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 and so it was complicated. And I started investigating. And I investigated something like 40 of the 70 whatever failures. And all of them were failing because of the same issue in the test framework. So I figured it's fine. It's fine. It's just, you know, I can clean up those tests, but I can clean them up later. Like, they're all, everything's fine. If I had actually continued investigating, what I would have found was that the 73rd failure of 78 failed for a real reason. So it's not necessarily about flaky tests. It's also about it's a signal to noise problem. Right? So what do you do when you've got this kind of mess, especially one that's existed for a really long time? And it's tempting. It is so tempting to just say, eh, it's not that big a deal. Maybe you're not being given the time to work on it. Maybe it's not getting prioritized. Maybe it doesn't feel like it's that big a deal. But the reality is that it's a huge deal. And the cleaner your feedback cycles are, the more you can trust CI. And the faster CI runs, the faster you're going to be able to learn. So ah, uh, it's important. So how do, you, how do you deal with this? Here are a few patterns that have worked uh, for us. Um, one is to segregate the tests into blocking versus not blocking. You keep running the flaky ones that you don't trust, but you also don't, don't stop the line when they go red. 
And so what you're doing is segregating out. Now, there is a risk here. Because if, like with my example of if I had looked at 73rd of 78 failures, if we actually believe that super important and critical information is hidden in those, this may or may not be a good idea. But if you are in a situation where you can afford to take the risk, then what you're really doing is saying, OK, here's the set of things where we trust. And here's this additional set of things that we don't trust. And this is now the bar. And over time, we're going to raise that bar. But everybody thought the bar was up here. The reality may have been that the bar wasn't actually up here because we didn't pay attention to any of this. And if we're not going to pay attention to it, we should just be honest about that and not pay attention to it explicitly, which means that we'll still run them and we'll still, still, still see how red they are. But we're going to segment those out into something that we don't consider blocking and we don't draw, uh, uh, stop the, the line for. Again, your mileage may vary. Be very careful about that one. Because there are situations where you can afford to take those risks, and then there are situations where you really shouldn't. Um, in the case of Cloud Foundry, uh, we, we did something like this, except actually we then took this and threw it away and rewrote it from scratch and, and ended up in a much better place. But we were at a place where we could afford to take the risk because Cloud Foundry was not an existing product that had an entire uh, massive set of, of uh, adopters at the time. Um, that, remember, this was like five years ago. Uh, however, if you look at something like Greenplum, Greenplum has now been around for um, 10 years, uh, I think. Um, it has hundreds of customers, and it's not something where we could afford to do that. That would have been, first of all, the first rule of databases, if I put my data in, I expect to get my data out. It's a mission critical thing. Uh, and so that means that, that we can't violate the prime directive and we can't risk that we're violating the prime directive. So we couldn't do that approach. Instead, we did this approach where we had teams. Now, we had a tragedy of the commons thing going on when tests failed. It was also super tempting. Remember, this was also the team that had team branches. So it was super tempting to say, yeah, that thing is failing. It's your problem. And they were all saying, it's your problem, which means we've got a tragedy of the commons. So we adopted a different pattern there. We said, OK, well, here are the teams. But we're going to stand up an ephemeral team, and everybody's going to take a turn. And that ephemeral team's job is to go clean up the commons. And so it took mo a few months. And notice that what we were doing there was whoops, really this. We were carving out time by ex explicitly extracting somebody from the team from you know like we had a pair working on it at any given time so with each person that came onto it they were not contributing to their team's work now now when I say uh, it's super important that to, to, to um, not try to get people to multitask so they wouldn't like this was their day job and then at night they would do other things for their team no no this was their full job for whatever period of dur uh, duration when they were rotating onto the cleanup team, they were 100% dedicated to cleaning up. And so we were really carving out time from the overall system to clean up a mess. And by the way, we did clean up that mess. Um, our uh, test runs went from, well, it, when I first got involved with the data team, it took six weeks for even the smallest change to get released. And now we're down to uh, lead time to do a release is about two days, only part of which is running um, tests. The tests themselves run in, in like a couple of hours. And so that's a phenomenal change. And it, it really tremendously paid off. Um, another way of carving out time, though, is to say, hey, everybody, Tuesday afternoons. We're going to spend Tuesday afternoons cleaning up tests. So how hard is that you do it? Take the time to clean up those tests because they are affecting your ability to ship. Um, and, and here's the next caution, though. So here's this dilemma. Here's this guy at, at the, the crossroads between pragmatism and expediency. So when we say, it'll be fine, we, we can ignore it, we're often taking the expedient path, which is so incredibly seductive. It leads to the swamp of despair. But in the moment that you're standing there and you're thinking, I could go do this thing that feels really hard, or I could get the illusion of progress, except you don't ever think about it that way in your head, or I could make progress by just 
doing this other thing. It's so tempting to go that way. Now, uh, sometimes this shows up as a false dilemma. So on one of our teams, somebody came to me and he said, Elizabeth, you keep telling us that we can't ship on red. You keep telling us that we can't push on red. But I'm telling you that to get from where we are to green is two years. So you, what you're telling us is that we're not going to ship for two years. That's not what I said. See, that's the pragmatic thing, right? So he's giving me this false dilemma. We can either take the path of expediency or we can do this thing that's impossible. It's a non-starter. Hmm. All of the, the, the techniques that I described before, those are examples of pragmatism. So within your environment, and, and this, it, for me, it's very visceral. Every day, I feel like we face this crossroads, and I stand there and check in with my, my, my gut and try to keep my spine strong and think about which path leads to the swamp of despair, but it's going to feel really good at the time walking that path because it's, it feels like the easier path. And we're, what we're actually doing is kicking the can farther down the road. And which path is the harder path, but ultimately it leads to the better answer. This is the challenge in front of us every single day. Now, sometimes the intrinsic motivation isn't enough. And we, we need extrinsic motivation. So uh, part of the way that we, we got there uh, with, with Green Plum to shorten those feedback cycles, part of the way we got there was frankly, I, I am not above bribing people. <laughs> so I was talking with an engineer who was kind of, resisting's the wrong word, because he knew it was the right thing to do, but he was feeling a little bit torn, because he was feeling like, ah, I could spend time cleaning up those tests, or I could spend time on this super valuable feature work. And, and I said, OK, look, tell you what. You reduce the test cycle time for the suite of tests by an hour from where it is today, lop off an hour and keep the coverage the same and I'll bake you a pie. And by the way, I make good pie. <laughs> that is actually a photo of one of my pies. That is an apple pie, completely from scratch, 100%, my grandmother's pie crust recipe. That is a good pie. <laughs> so he did, I did. He lopped off an hour from the test suite. I brought in a pie. Everybody else on the team said, wait, why does George get a pie? Because <laughs> I, I didn't just give George a pie. I, I brought the pie to stand up. And I announced the pie. And they said, well, why does George get the pie? And I explained. And they said, well, OK, we want pie. <laughs> this just goes to show you rewards in your system do not need to be things that cost you money that you have to fight HR about. If you can bake a pie or whatever a, is, treat is appropriate in your environment, there you go. So we lopped a lot of time off that test suite, and I baked a lot of pies before finally the team said, we're kind of sick of pie. <laughs> and I said, well, fine then. So we got them cupcakes, which I don't make, by the way, so, but we've got some good cupcake vendors. And All right. Now, uh, here's the thing about, about pie and why I am telling you this story. This is actually the pipeline. My word, <laughs> I don't think I have ever been so afraid of an audience rushing the stage. That went over terribly, I'm so sorry. Okay, moving on. I'm not sure there's any recovery after that. Should I just drop the mic and walk off? No, let's finish, okay. Um, so you've tightened your feedback cycles. Oh, yes. Some very quick feedback. We that was a very appreciative groan. Oh, thank you so much for the feedback. Appreciative groan. Okay. Thank you. Uh, once upon a time, before I joined Pivotal, I was a consultant. My job was to get on airplanes and go help people with their agile transformations. Part of my consulting practice was doing a simulation that I called the word count simulation. Uh, they, uh, it starts with um, the people in the room 
are uh, playing different roles working for a software company, and this is all in quotes because everything about the simulation is on paper. No code actually gets written at any time. All of the work is done on index cards, but we have a tester group and we have a developer group and we have a PM group. And then we have this super weird role of the computer because the computer has to interpret the code written on index cards by the developers to take input, turn it into output, and it does, as you probably would expect from the name, count words on cards. So you put in an input that's got a sentence on it, and it spits out an output that gives word and then the count of that word on the input. Make sense? OK, I, I ran that Agile transformation simulation uh, over 150 times. So I've watched a lot of organizations uh, transition to an agile process. By the way, the way the rest of the simulation works is this is the initial setup. They work for 15 minutes. Their goal is to ship um, as much as they can to make money from the customer. I play the customer. I will take features as soon as they're ready. They don't need to do a Big Bang release. They always do a Big Bang release anyway. It never fails. In the first round, they are not allowed to talk to each other. They are at separate tables. When I am feeling particularly evil, I will put them in separate rooms. Um, they are only allowed to talk through the inter-office mail courier that runs around delivering messages. Um, ironically, in the first round, inevitably, they are terrified that there will not be enough bandwidth for communication, but then nobody actually sends any notes. <laughs> Like this, this is what happens about 95% of the time. It's, it's, it's kind of astonishing. Um, uh, and then at the end of the 15 minutes, I say, okay, so you've made zero because nobody ever makes money in round one. Let's talk about the working agreements that I had established for you that you had to follow. Um, and now you get to own your process. How do you want to change? And so it's an entire day of a simulated Agile transition where the participants get to be a self-organizing team and transform their practices through reflecting and adapting to improve the outcome with the next round. And typically, groups start making money around round three, maybe round four, occasionally in overtime in minute 17 of a 15-minute round in round four um, because not shipping anything and making zero is depressing and inhibits learning. So, uh, but this is, this is the simulation. Now, the reason I'm telling you about this, though, is because this simulation, frankly, taught me quite possibly more than it taught some people in the simulation itself, because watching patterns over and over and over again, where people succeeded and where they failed, and what the, the comparison, the compare and contrast between the groups that seemed to succeed and the groups that seemed to fail, was absolutely fascinating. And one thing that was common with every group that did well in this simulation was they found mechanisms to create visibility. It was not enough to run the tests running the tests and then having them displayed in a way that made it obvious to literally everyone in the room what was going on was the most powerful thing. By the way, side note, uh, it's worth noting that I ran this with a group of Agile consultants mm -hmm. at, uh, <laughs> at a conference. Um, it was wildly entertaining. They almost didn't ship. <laughs> Sometimes failure can be the most illuminating, because one of them walked up to me afterward and said, that was absolutely fascinating. I did nothing that I tell my customers to do. <laughs> I will have to reflect on that. <laughs> In any case, creating visibility is hugely important, and that's why um, I noticed that Go, GoCD is one of the, the sponsors. Woohoo! Yay, pipelines! Um, yay, visibility. Uh, uh, we happen to use Concourse, this is a Concourse screen, um, but, but the point is, is really about creating this visibility so that literally everyone can see it all the time. If you walk around our workspaces, you'll see these gigantic monitors that are always displaying the, the build status so that it's always only a glance away. It's not even a URL click away, it's just a look up over your shoulder away. And it creates that visibility for absolutely everyone, which then helps the team hold themselves accountable. And again, this is, it's so important that it's not about blame. So nobody ever, ever walks around the space and goes, why is your build red? 
right, not your build. Notice the your part. I mean, they might say, why is our build red? But that is a fundamentally different thing than a random act of management, somebody walking through and acting all blamey about their build being red, right? This is about visibility for the team. Okay, so in conclusion, how do you care for your feedback cycles, the care and feeding of your feedback cycles? You keep them super, super tight. So shorten them as much as you can. Move as much of the feedback, um, what is it, shift left, but move it as, as, as uh, making them as, as short as possible. Don't wait for acceptance testing for anything that you actually are asking the question. Um, did I write the code I intended to write? Um, so keep them super short, keep them super clean, and make them super, super visible to absolutely everybody. Um, and then here's the kicker. Remember that a, a, a feedback cycle is do a thing, see what happened, do another thing. Turns out the Kolb learning model, the Kolb um, learning cycle, is basically another feedback cycle. It's run an experiment, have that experience, observe and reflect on the results, and uh, 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 create an abstraction in your head of what you learned from that and then have another experience. So when we talk about feedback cycles, they really are learning cycles. And all of us are aiming to have a learning organization. That's how we all win, right? So ultimately, there is no failure. There is only learning. By the way, there are some weeks when I do an awful lot of learning. <laughs> so. Anyway, that's, that's what I, I came to say. Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, there was one of your slides that was, uh, don't confuse speed with product progress. Content? Progress. Oh, progress. Yeah, I was wondering if you could just give any uh, more concrete examples of that. It wasn't totally clear to me what that Got it. kind of meant. So the, the example that I gave at the time was the teams checking in features on, on their team branch, but then potentially having to throw that entirely away. I'll give you a, another example. Um, that uh, happened, this is a, a green plum thing. So green plum was a fork of Postgres way back in the day. One of our ongoing initiatives is to merge upstream changes from Postgres into green plum. It was forked for something like eight years before we started this, seven years, something like, I mean, forked for a really, really long time. So, and you've got something that runs inherently single node and you're making it a multi-node thing. So you can imagine that there are some challenges. The first time that we uh, attempted the first batch going from Postgres 8.2 to Postgres 8.3, the team that was doing those merges were experts in Postgres, not experts at the time in Greenplum. And so they left behind a whole bunch of fix me's they felt awesome about their progress. They felt amazing because look, they got, they got this thing that had been forked so long ago from 8.2 to 8.3 in like weeks. Yeah, it was not shippable. <laughs> there was a point when I, I'm, I should not be admitting this on camera, but I'm going to. Um, there was a point when I was actually not sure if we would release Green Plum 5 ever. Um, because we confused speed with progress. Now, the happy ending, by the way, is that we did release Green Plum 5 and the Postgres merge continues, so there was a happy ending to that story. Um, but oh my goodness, were there lessons learned about batch size and speed versus progress. Does that help? Yeah, that's, that's perfect, thanks. Sweet. Yes. Uh, hi, you said a lot about visibility. If you could pick three things to put on uh, screens in your office, what were the three things you'd pick as visibility? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, in our context, now, now I work on shipping enterprise products that we do not actually run an as a service of version. So for the products that we have, the three things are pipelines, pipelines, and pipelines. They're just different pipelines because they're massively complicated products. However, uh, for Cloud Foundry, where we do run an as a service version, the three things, we currently have pipelines and lots of them. Um, we also have all of the, the monitoring. We've got a, the single pane of glass for monitoring the as-a-service version, which, by the way, the whole the real reason we run the as-a-service version of Cloud Foundry is so that we learn about operating it. Um, and uh, there is nothing like having people who rely on your stuff uh, and will be really upset if your thing goes down to, and having the engineers on call for that thing to teach you about how to make it better as a shipping enterprise product. It's a phenomenal experience, but the, the pain of glass around operability, which helped us learn more about the instrumentation that we had to build into the product so that our customers could operate it better. Um, and then the third thing 
that I would do is it, it, with an as a service offering, I would also want to have visibility around the business side of the metrics, which we do not currently have. But if you've got an as a service thing, I want to see all of the instrumentation around the, whether you're doing A-B tests or cohort analysis or anything that you can get frequent feedback on. The one thing that I do not want to put on those monitors are PowerPoint decks that don't change. I watched one organization do that. They bought, at the time that monitors were ridiculously expensive, they bought these insanely expensive, like $2,000 monitors, and then they put up PowerPoints that they changed like maybe once a quarter. Print a poster. Way cheaper. <laughs> Anybody else? Ah. Um, you mentioned that uh, you something had changed your mind about feature branches. Previously, you'd always advocated committing to master. Could you say a bit more about about that? So, what changed my mind was in this particular context. So, it's a very context-dependent thing. Um, to actually complete a body of work takes sufficiently long that if they were trying to merge in, I mean, feature flagging is the alternative, but feature flagging was actually going to introduce so much complexity in the code. In this particular case, because of the nature of the legacy code and the fact that feature flagging was definitely not a simple answer, that it's a trade-off. So we could, we could effectively branch it in the code in terms of the execution path with feature flags, but massive complexity and huge overhead. Or we could take the hit of a few days worth of work, not making it into to master, and that was, that was the preferable trade-off in this case. Everything's a trade-off. Once you optimize for one thing, you, you are um, uh, in, in, in making a choice to not optimize for the other thing. And so figuring out what you're trading off is the key. Yes. Yeah. So you talked about um, moving from working on branches to pairing and then um, committing directly to master. Did you have people doing both things at the same time, or did you move one team completely to one way of working? We did. It was terrible. <laughs> so uh, we were trying to be. So here's the thing: if if you are trying to shift the culture of an entire organization, and you take the hard line "no, you will do it my way" approach, that's going to alienate people. And we made a decision to not alienate people, but the end result was chaos. And ultimately, uh, well, probably there are stories that I won't tell on camera that I'll just wait until like the bar after to tell you, but I'll just tell you that yes, we did for a while have both ways of working, and no, it didn't work, and no, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Uh, great talk, really useful and actionable. Um, I just want to pick up on that point about alienation, where if something, if a feedback mechanism is presenting something as failure, and that failure can kind of be a cause of sort of despondence or kind of you know stepping away from it or you know whatever, do you have any strategies or any tips for preventing that from from preventing that alienation from happening? Um, I'm going to question whether that despondence is actually alienation or the ripping away of an illusion. So uh, the most important thing that we can do in the culture is to make it safe to fail. Because if it's not safe to fail, then yeah, people are going to like sweep things under the rug. So I'll tell you a, another pivotal story. I, I got an email from my boss. My boss is Rob Mee. He's the CEO. When I get a, an email from him that basically says, you have quality problems, I'm going, I mean, I would pay attention to it anyway, no matter who it came from. But in this particular case, I'm, I'm getting this from Rob. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I went back and looked at what made him say that. And I, I wrote back to him and I said, no, 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 this is good news. Because we always had these problems, but you're hearing about them now, which means that it's safe for people to tell you that these things are happening. This is a win. So the, it, I, I don't know how to prevent somebody from being sad, but I do know how to prevent somebody from being scared. And that's by making sure that there is literally nothing that, that could possibly be interpreted as punishment or uh, recrimination or blame when a box goes red. It's just information. So I was wondering if you've had an experience of working in an organization where you've showed people this speculation inventory that's building up and you've showed them the feedback loops and made it all visible and they don't want to listen. 
Oh, totally. So, so that startup that I wrote about in 2001, that by the way, also died in 2001, but I wrote the paper before it died. Um, oh yeah, no, my boss and I had really long conversations in which he said, yeah, this is nice theory, but, but this is somehow all your fault and go fix it. And then I would say, but this is how we're gonna fix it. And he would say, well, yeah, yeah, it's theory. And no, they, they didn't listen and yes, they're dead now. <laughs> Which, which does not, by the way, mean that you should always listen to me or you die. That is not the lesson <laughs> to be taken here. Is it time? Yeah. It's time. Sorry, All right. So thank you all so much.